So next up, um, what we've all been waiting for, we have a session from the brilliant Natasha Trotman about anti-oppressive co-creation. On the main stage yesterday, we heard a, pow a powerful keynote from Dory Tunso on decolonizing design. And Natasha's session will provide some practical advice on how. Natasha is an award-winning international equalities designer and researcher whose practice explores extending the frontier of knowledge around mental difference, non-typical body forms, ways of being and marginalized experiences. Natasha seeks to reframe mainstream notions of equality, equity, diversity and inclusion towards post-normative equity through an intersectional design lens spanning multi-modular interactions, play shaping, investigative play and policy design. Natasha has also helped the Design Council to create this year's Design for Planet Festival. What an uh, amazing um, experience uh, and CV she has, and I'll just hand you over to Natasha now. Thank you, Alicia. Um, pleasure to be here, and um, thank you all for joining us. Um, so, yes, uh, Dory Tonstall's, um, to Dory Tonstall's contribution yesterday was amazing. Um, today, I will be contributing from using a neurodivergent and disabled lens on this topic. Um, so, we'll begin. So, uh, welcome to this turbocharged session on unleashing the power of collective action uh, and collaboration through anti-oppressive co-creation. And just as a disclaimer, I am neurodivergent and disabled, and I do use scripts. Um, so today we will be looking at challenges faced by neurodivergent and multiply marginalized people. We will consider normative and normalized methods and approaches and how this can impact minoritized and multiply minoritized people. And we will consider the components of change making and the potential impacts on our practice, the wider sector and beyond. So I think Alicia did a really um, amazing job of uh, introducing me. So we'll probably skip to the next slide now. My motivation is post-normative equity, as everybody knows. So um, moving things beyond the normative clock and reference man. Um, I've exhibited widely and, um, as you know, created multimodal uh, offerings and interactions. And it's all about bringing into focus um, how deeply ingrained non-disabled mindsets and norms can be and alternative ways of being. So let's consider, let's consider language, thought and culture. If you can remember back far enough, you close your eyes and think about a time where you existed and there were no words. So that would probably be when you were a toddler, if you can think that far back. Uh, when English wasn't your native language or whatever the language it is that you speak now, but rather the language of thought. Let's say many of us learned how to translate the language of thought into our respective languages so that we can communicate with others who also speak this language, such as English. Um, what other ways are there to express our language of thought? So I have a quote here. Energy is our first language. Words are our second. And that's how autistic activist Percy Forbes describes it. Also, let's consider other ways that we can communicate values, interests, thoughts, and feelings. And let's also think about Howard Gardner's rainbow intelligences. The idea of engaging and learning that goes beyond the traditional. So this includes spatial art, spatial, musical, bodily kinesthetic, ways of being and engaging in the world and communicating. Okay. 
all right, based on what you've considered, you know a few things about how you communicate. But how do you know what you know? So there's a short activity to everyone. And for this, you will need something to write with, paper or a device you can write on. And we're going to explore our social and internal maps. So for this, this can be for you only. It doesn't necessarily have to be for your eyes. It can just be for you, however you want to engage with it, and your social map of the world. So consider and note down who you spend your time with, why you spend your time with them, where you spend your time with them, what do they look like? Do they have a religion? Their age? Are they disabled, non-disabled? How do you communicate with them? It might be through bodily movement, maybe music, or song. It may be through mouth words, speaking. So we'll allow for two minutes for everyone to consider that. Note that down. I'll just set my timer. Okay. About 30 seconds left now. Okay, if we start winding up now. Ending up our thoughts or pausing them, you can return to them later if you wish. Okay, did anything interesting come up? Did anything expected or unexpected come up? Is your social map diverse or what do we define as diverse? Are there many people that share your interests within your social map or communication methods? All worth thinking about. Okay. So there are varied ways of being and communicating. And it's important when engaging with others to understand um, their values and preferred communication styles, uh, especially when you're engaging with um, different groups and individuals. Um, so it's good to know these things so you can adapt your style and address the, any requirements or adjustments to meet people where they are on their terms. Crafting relational as opposed to, as opposed to transactional engagements. So Consider multiple points of reference. That includes ways in, socioeconomic background, decentralizing power. Acknowledge the construct of the dominant culture and ideologies. It may be different depending on where you are in the globe, but from where I am, that would be a Eurocentric uh, Western standpoint move towards alternative and emerging methods within design and co-creation okay so that's what the deconstruction in different ways of thinking about these communication styles different types of people what we're moving towards but we know it's not always easy there are hurdles so we need to also consider Normative communication hierarchies, I think we've covered this. Points of contact and support, something you need to design into your engagements um, when you are doing them. Normative timelines and expectations, and by that I mean uh, clock time and uh, crypt time and poly 
chronic time. Um, clock time is based on the normative nine to five notions of time. And that's all about, well, it's quite centered on productivity and grip time um, is uh, created by Alison Kafer and it, it refers to a way of thinking um, and understanding in a different way. And it illuminates the complexity of disabled experiences in the Western world. Okay, and normative energy expectations, and that can vary from uh, person to person. It's also worth noting Christine Misarandino's uh, spoon theory in regards to uh, energy and um, how that's quantified within disabled and autistic and chronically ill communities. So there's lots of considering happening. So we've talked a little bit about socioeconomic um, diversity. So also consider vertical inequality, horizontal inequality, economic inequality, and social inequality, or differences, diversity. Bringing that into focus, making that invisible, visible, but really it's bringing it into our awareness. Now, previously we mapped out our worlds and this, the exosystem aims to bring another component into our worlds if you were not aware of it. So the, uh, this summarize, I will summarize it, it is um, in, in a book in regards to uh, neuroethics and bioethics and neurodivergence in architecture. And I have provided a reading list, there'll be one at the end. But to summarize, uh, the exosystem maps out lived experiences of the multiply marginalized, neurodivergent and disabled. It considers notions of a double consciousness. Um, and that was uh, created by W.E.B. Du Bois and beyond. Um, the challenges may not be insurmountable, but even triumphs can take a toll um, on challenges, uh, especially if they are uh, perpetual. Uh, this can have a weathering effect, and this is a term coined by Dr. Arlene Geronimus, and weathering is a term for chronic stress, which she says literally wears down your heart, your arteries, and the neuroendocrine system. I bet I've said that wrong. I've tried my best with that word. All your body's systems, so that in effect you become chronically old at a young age. So oppressive practice um, really does age people, it really does take a toll. Um, she writes about this phenomenon in her new book, Weathering the Extraordinary Stress of Ordinary Life in an Unjust Society. Inequitable practices can lead to uh, oppressive experiences, as I've mentioned. So co-creation and co-production burnout can be an outcome, it's undesirable. Uh, but being transparent about the process and equalizing the dynamic informed by the values, wants and needs of the people you're engaging with can be a step to address this. And this can look like accessible and accelerated and adjusted routes into engagements and or ways to contribute this may be training, making reasonable adjustments, for example. Now, business as usual can reproduce oppressive outcomes. You do not need to be actively ableist, racist, or sexist to reproduce oppressive outcomes. Now, to address some of these, we might need to utilize our power um, and this was created in the uh, 1980s by Lisa Van Klessen and Valerie Miller. They're both educators and activists, and they've created this quad of power. So power over authority and control, power to able to act, power with collective action, and power within confidence and dignity. Now, another component of um, 
power and utilizing power and creating safe, equitable spaces is held spaces. So I would say held spaces over safe spaces. And this means that you can, sh the person can share challenges or group, um, be honest and have agency in the process. Held spaces look like a person who's facilitating being emotionally, mentally, and physically present or virtually present um, for someone and focusing on supporting them and creating positive outcomes for them. And as we're talking about power, we know that within the disabled community, neurodivergent community, we are very strong on nothing about us without us. Okay, so relational, over, transactional, and extractive. So we've been talking about using the powers and this uses power with, power to, and power within. And um, I use my power to contribute to change making, working towards a post normative, fairer, fully accessible, and more equitable world, as you all know. But this includes engaging with the local governments, including being appointed as a member of the co production strategic implementation panel for the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. So I'm ensuring that I'm illuminating other voices within the community and ensuring that this trade change is uh, long term and influencing is long term. So we use our collective power to equalize official and unofficial discourse. And this is something explored further by Stuart Hall, who actually coined the term. Uh, I contribute to change making and work towards um, making the changes I've mentioned um, through the panels that I'm on and um, and just illuminating the voices of my peers and bringing them into focus and trying to create accelerated alternative and adjusted routes in. Another example of this is um, uh, being a lived experience reviewer, contributing to the decision making process on deciding which applications receive funding um, and that what's being offered is authentic and truly makes a, uh, if not unique, um, tangible change to the communities and isn't purely uh, extractive. Now, there's lots of ways in regards to engagement and um, the policy lab has created a ladder of citizen participation and adaptation of Sherry R. Arnstein's participation, uh, a ladder of participation, citizen participation. So um, I'm happy to provide the links for that. Another important component is with change making comes, you know, authentic production, co-creation, um, it can't, it, it's personal, professional and collective. We don't just stop when the, you know, when we leave the building, uh, someone like myself, it, it continues on. So in order to help with this growth or what we like to term growing pains, um, we need to engage with reflexive and reflective practice um, and positive obsolescence so, you know, addressing things such as, you know, what could be termed or deemed as an economic threat, you know, reframing that as an opportunity for growth and a change in practice. So, this lends itself to more so, more so, more morphological approaches. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very neurodivergent today, guys, the spoons are low, <laughs> morphological approaches and analysis. And this helps us think about a problem in new ways, splitting the problem into its component parts and uh, exploring the range of possibilities for each part, exploring this from different frames of reference and putting the re-articulated problem back together and even formulating solutions in interesting and surprising ways. Now we have talked about intersectionality and intersectional and contextual analysis, different ways of being. As we know, these challenges are enduring, as mentioned by Mary Prince in 1831, um, uh, an intersectional neurodivergent disabled uh, person who was formerly enslaved. So it, you know, these challenges do have a lineage. 
Um, but more presently, uh, there's been methods and approaches created, for example, to deal with it in the current day, um, Kimberly Crenshaw. So Kimberly Crenshaw is a civil rights activist and scholar and looks at this through the intersectional lens and she coined the term and created the framework in 1989. From a design perspective, perspective. Sasha Constanza Chok also explores this within her work on and around des design justice looking at affordances. So we've talked about a lot. As I mentioned before, it would be quite turbocharged um, and there's a lot to consider. So what's the next practice? Well, after universal design explores the shift in landscapes and how uh, contemporary practitioners, activists, and um, transdisciplinary working is engaging with this shift in landscape to bring these um, challenges I've mentioned into focus and address them and move towards post normative equity. So, um, this book is After Universal Design, The Disability Design Revolution. Um, it's edited by Elizabeth Guffey and it includes uh, my chapter next practice towards equality design. So this session, it doesn't necessarily give you the answers on how to, you know, these are ingredients. So you're presented with ingredients on how to, you know, create equitable, um, anti-oppressive collaboration and co-creation. So it has been quite turbocharged. So thank you for your continued engagement. And we're now coming to the final thoughts, the top tips and takeaways. So be a radical accomplice, not a proxy. So you have your authentic uh, disabled neurodivergent lived experience involved fully, relational engagement, make space, have held space, share power, whichever those powers are, or all of them, eradicate assumptions, widen your circle, embrace creative disruption and critiques. And these are but a few ways to contribute to equitable outcomes. So my question, provocation to you all is, how will you use your power, powers, to contribute to equitable realities and fairer futures? Oh, all thank you so much Natasha we just have two two minutes left so that was incredible and I'd love for you to go through the the resources as well um just a quick just like um interject to say that I think the social map exercise was incredible at the start as well to get us all thinking about the wider context and um thinking about how to improve on things I'll leave you back to, to go back to the resources we do have the results from the polls as well which I might just add in at the end but um this is um, a priority um, so yeah please continue with your resources there you go and I can add some more and, and share it post session amazing is there any um, specific ones that you would pull out um, for people to, to start with potentially um, I think design justice by Constanza Chalk mm -hmm. is start um, reference man is mentioned a lot um, I unpack that within both the chapters I've written, one on bioethics and neuroethics and neurodivergence in architecture. I also uh, unpack Reference Man within um, after uh, Universal Design within my chapter in that book. Um, it was created by the International Commission on Radiological uh, Protection, but has worked into its way into everything a reference man in jewels within medications uh, seat belts and um that leads on to uh, the book by D. perez uh invisible women exposing data bias in a world designed for men so that i think yeah so those ones <laughs> that's so helpful and maybe we can just go over a little bit in the stream we'll see if we get cut out and um, but I have one kind of question overall just kind of summarize some of the the really interesting things that were asked so how can we ensure that co-creation um, sessions are not just inclusive but are also representative of diverse voices how would you summarize 
that? Yeah, I think for me personally, what I would, what I tend to do before I engage in um, creating sessions is I do observations and that can take various forms. So I would say if it's a community, then, you know, try your best to build a relationship with a steward within that community. You know, as I mentioned before, it's about the relational um, engagement as opposed to transactional. So um, relationships can take time, but they're worth it. And um, once you have the trust of that, that community or person, then um, that's where you will begin to uh, discover lots of different things and have, you know, remarkable insights. Amazing. Thank you so much, Natasha, for that um, incredible session. Um, Jam-packed, so many brilliant resources. We'll collate, collate these and um, send them over uh, after as well.